U.S. Division of Military Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York. It is um, the 2nd of, I was going to say March, April 2003. Um, it is approximately 1 p.m. Uh, the interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Would you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Robert J. Ostrander, Robert Johnson Ostrander. Uh, I was born November 7th, 1923, in Walden, New York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering military service? Uh, I graduated from high school, and I took one extra year of high school as a postgraduate. And then I worked for the Walden Telephone Company mm -hmm. when I was drafted. Okay. Um, could you tell me what you remember when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Where were you? What was your reaction? And I was in a movie theater in Newburgh, New York, and they interrupted the theater and, and showed things on the screen that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed by the Japanese and... Mm -hmm told us a lot of information about it, which was quite startling at the time. Mm -hmm. I got a little interesting story, too. Sure. Uh, uh, when I worked for the Walden Telephone Company, the uh, people who interview you and get you to sign up in the military, I'm trying to think of the group, but, uh, but anyway, he came to the Walden Telephone Company and wanted me to sign up in the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. And I was only 19 years old, and I wasn't quite ready. So I, uh, I told him I'd rather wait. I think he had something to do with it because uh, he said to let him know when the, I got drafted uh, so they would get me in the signal court. But within a week, I seen the papers, and I let him know, and he did all the arrangements. And I, I, I would have went to school for 50 weeks and stayed working, and then I would have gone in the signal court. Mm -hmm. But I got drafted, and I went to Camp Upton. In Camp Upton, they issued me Signal Corps Excuse parade. Me, when were you drafted? Uh, it was in January 1943. Okay. And uh, I, uh, they issued me Signal Corps braid for my hat, Signal Corps pin for my lapel. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there. I shipped out of there. I was supposed to go to Fort Monmouth for uh, basic training. I ended up in Atlantic City. Uh, New Jersey in the Air Force in basic training. Took basic training on the boardwalk and in the sand. It was quite interesting. They reclassified me there. They have a, <coughs> uh, a switchboard at each airfield location with extension all around, and they classified me as a person that would maintain the switchboard and the telephone. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to go to North Carolina, I can't remember the camp now, and get that training. Mm -hmm. But I shipped out, of course, when you shipped out, you didn't know where you were going. I went to Camp Lee, Virginia, Quartermaster Corps, and I was in truck driver school. And I went to truck driver school for, I think it was nine weeks, and they reclassified me there as a uh, Signal Corps lineman, and all the linemen had to have truck driver's license. So I got a truck driver's license. Then I was supposed to go back to Fort Monmouth. And I shipped out of there and I ended up in Westover Field, Massachusetts, in the 880th Airborne Engineers. And the guy that interviewed me says, oh, wonderful, just what we need. We need an electrician. But he says, it's filled right now, so I'll put you out driving the tractor. So I went out and drove a tractor, <laughs> learned how to drive a tractor. They were little tractors, Clark Air, as they were called, not the little gasoline engine and so forth. Mm -hmm. I got woke up in the middle of the night by our first sergeant and said, pack up, you're shipping out. And we went to Caterpillar Factory in Peoria, Illinois, and went to Diesel Mechanic School. We uh, took a Caterpillar tractor right off the assembly line, tore it all down, put it all back together again, supposedly made all the adjustments and everything. And then from there, I went to Laterno Factory, which is what that picture is uh -huh. there. Now, would you show that yeah. in front of you? The, the turn. You bring it, bring it back closer to you. Okay. That's okay. The Laterno is the big earth-moving equipment that are on the back of tractors. They make graders, and they also make the things that the tractors pull to pick up dirt and equipment. And whereabouts are you in that picture? Uh, I am. Um, 
right there, if you can see it. Okay. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about that is that uh, you have blacks in, in the training with you. Yes, yep. Uh, this is 1943. 1943. They slept in separate barracks and separate planes. Actually, we were in a hotel mm -hmm. uh, while we were there going to school, and the blacks were in a different hotel. I don't know exactly where, but they were segregated. We weren't mm -hmm. together. What, were you in classes together? Yes, we were in classes together, worked together. Mm -hmm. No was problem. there ever any problems at all? Or were Not there, there no. There wasn't any there. Mm -hmm. And then I got the 880th training. And uh, from there we went to Sedalia Army Air Force Base in uh, Missouri. And we took uh, glider training. And we were airborne engineers. And we landed in gliders and so forth. We took our glider training there. And there was no blacks there. They were all there. Mm -hmm. Now, did you uh, get your glider wings? No, we did not. You did not? Huh? And did you ever fly in gliders? No, we, we rode in them. We didn't mm -hmm. drive them. Yes, right. Yeah. We did ride in them, and we rode them there, and we also rode in some overseas. Mm -hmm. But you never received glider wings? Never received glider wings. I didn't know. I'd never seen them except the pilots had a wing that they wore. Mm -hmm. But we never got any. And then from, we finished the training there, we went to Camp Stolem in California, getting ready to ship out overseas. And we uh, were on the HMS Sommelsdijk, which was a Dutch freighter that was converted to a troop ship. There's a picture of that. Yeah, there is a picture of the Sommelsdijk in there. Right, we'll, we'll show that later. In okay. And uh, that was interesting, too, because the blacks were on the back of the boat, and we were on the front of the boat. And the blacks uh, did most of the KP and that type of work. And our, our guys did the uh, MPs, military police. Worst part of it is we had to pull duty down the black hole in the, in the bottom of the boat. And, a lot of them got sick, and <laughs> they'd go throw up the barrel, and we'd go throw up with them. <laughs> but the, there was some segregation there. They kept them segregated, and mm -hmm. we crossed the equator, and all the white guys had to go through the initiation first, and then the black second. They weren't together. Oh, so it was separately. Yep, separately, segregated them. Mm -hmm. yep. And all the while I was in the service, there was never any blacks in our outfits. Mm -hmm. Separate outfits. Now, the ones that trained with you were in a separate. Did they do the same work that you did? Same work we did. And, and we did it together, just like going to school, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked together, no problems. Mm -hmm. and, but they didn't sleep in the same place or eat in the same mm -hmm. place. Okay. So, uh, where did you go? Okay. It took us 55 days on board ship the HMS Sommelsdijk, all by itself with no convoy or anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, we broke down once. We spent about three days drifting in the water until they got the engine fixed. It was becoming a problem, and then we went on. But we zigzagged all over the ocean with 55 days. We came into Port Moresby in New Guinea. We didn't land there, but we uh, pulled in there, and then we went up to Ley, New Guinea. And we landed there. Went in and we worked on an airstrip there. And, uh, and we hopped uh, several times in New Guinea. We'd go from one place to another. We'd bypass the Japs. The Japs had the whole thing, and the, we would jump around them and cut them off, and they'd be segregated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an interesting story. The paratroopers were supposed to land at the Japanese airfields and capture the fields and fix it so we could come in the gliders, which we did a couple of times and it worked out fine. One time they goofed and the paratroopers missed the wrong place and the wrong time. <laughs> we landed first, but we're lucky the Japs thought we were heavy equipment people and whatnot. They got it cleared out for us so we didn't have too bad of a time. And then we were there to pick up the, the paratroopers when they landed. 
So how many times did you land in gliders? Uh, three times. Did you ever have any problems landing? We always had problems landing. Mm -hmm. They were, we, with no wheels over there, mm -hmm. you were on skids, runners like, and uh, they, many of them crashed. Uh, and sometimes you would land it in the jungles and there just wasn't a place to do it. And the gliders, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but we'd have a Jeep or a, a small Caterpillar, small Clark Air tractor, a case tractor in the Jeep with us. Mm -hmm. And it was all rigged up so that the, when you drove out, it would raise the front end of the glider up and you went out the front end. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you landed and you were right up on the front end. So then we'd have to break out of the side of the glider, which wasn't too bad, and tip it back so we could get the tractor or the uh, people that were in there out. Mm -hmm. um, when you were in the gliders, how, usually how many men were in? Uh, you might have a squad of eight men mm -hmm. or uh, a tractor and a couple men. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also had quite a bit of equipment that they had. Lots of times we'd use pierce plank. Pierce plank is a metal that you put on top of a runway to fill in holes and things like that. We, we did that to fix the runways up. Mm -hmm. And then the bigger planes could land and bring in more equipment, more soldiers and so forth. So. Now, who usually uh, tied the equipment down when you loaded the glider? We did. Mm -hmm. And a few times we moved in C-47 from one place to another without the gliders. And we took all of our equipment in the C-47. And some of that we have to take all apart to get it in. Like we had the, uh, what do they call them, two by eight uh, trucks, mm -hmm. big trucks. We'd have to take them all apart to get them in the C-47 and put them all together again when we landed. But How did you get them up into the C-47? Uh, carefully. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of hand work and... Uh, we did have some tractors to push them and other things mm -hmm. like that to get them up in there. Uh, interesting experience. I guess so. And then now, we, what, what uh, the 880th Airborne Engineers, what were they attached to? What uh, larger we, unit? We were attached to the 5th Air Force. Fifth Air, oh, you were attached to the Air Force? Yep, to the Air Force. Mm -hmm. yep. We were considered Army Air Corps back then. Mm -hmm. But we were attached to the 5th Air Force. And then we went into Landia, we, Landia, New Guinea, which we built a big airport there. Also built headquarters for MacArthur, who had a huge place on top of a mountain with a long road going up to it and a big bar and all kinds of goodies that we never had in our tents. <laughs> did you ever see MacArthur? Yes, I saw him a couple times, yep. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, what did you think of him? Uh, we didn't like him too much. Uh, I guess he was a real good soldier and everything else, but he was always, uh, well, like if his plane flew in, he had half a dozen fighter planes around him to protect him, uh, and he'd always have a, a company of soldiers guarding him so you couldn't get too close to him, and uh, he had all the comforts of home when he got there and everything, and took good care of him. So, in fact, when... Uh, uh, when they built the home and this place on Hollandia, New Guinea, uh, <clears throat> all of our troops uh, were taking out war bonds and stuff, and we spent millions of dollars, although it was a rest area for us because it wasn't any fighting or anything. Mm -hmm. We were just building his headquarters, and uh, most of us stopped our war bonds that we were buying because of the money we spent for MacArthur's headquarters. And I understand he was only there about eight days. And we spent millions of dollars building this place for him and for him to land. And I suppose some New Guinea native has it now. <laughs> and in Hollandia, they broke up the 871st engineers and the 880th engineers. And they were both airborne. And they made us 871st. They still called us airborne engineers. But we were heavy equipment engineers then. We got... Caterpillar tractors and the big equipment, and we uh, went to several islands. Bayak off of New Guinea is one, and we built a big airstrip on Bayak. And uh, Aoi is another one. Uh, we went in and built an airstrip there. Uh, and then we were 
on the invasion of the Philippines. We went on uh, LST landing ship troops, mm -hmm. and in the uh, Lingang Gulf, in the invasion of Lingang Gulf, and we were—I think we were day three mm -hmm. when they first started when we went in. Mm -hmm. Were you under fire when you landed? Yes, we were under fire, mm -hmm. and it, because we were mechanics. We had, uh, one of our jobs was we had 50-gallon drums of gasoline on the ship with us. And we were rolling them through the water, getting them up, and a Jap plane come over and scraped us while we were rolling these 50-gallon drums of gasoline. We left the drums of gasoline. We <laughs> got out of there. <laughs> but they washed up on shore. We got them later. But mm -hmm. Jap planes were around, and they come out and give us a, a call in the middle of the night, they come in and bomb us. There was one plane that they could never find that came over and he bomb us every once in a while at night. Another problem we have with the Japs, they went up in the mountains and, well, one case we we sprayed for insects and they thought we were gassing them. And they all came down out of the mountains and committed suicide trying to take people. And But what they did mostly, they would strap their body with hand grenades, and they'd jump on the tail of an airplane and raise their arms up and all the hand grenades go up and blow the tail off of the uh, the airplane. That they were doing damage like that, committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Harry Carey, I guess they called it. But, uh, they did quite a bit of that. And one time they come down when we were in eight men tents and uh, I was sleeping away like mad and they sounded the alarm and everything, and all the guys went out and hopped in the foxholes around the tent. And I was fast asleep in the tent, and the Japs come in the tent, and the guys didn't dare shoot them because they knew I was in there. <laughs> but luckily they didn't do anything to me. <laughs> I never knew it until they left. <laughs> what kind of weapons did you carry, sidearms? Uh, mostly M1s. I had a carbine, mm -hmm. and I was a T4 uh, no, sergeant. And we had a carbine because it made us easier getting around and mm -hmm. working on equipment and stuff. Did we carry a pistol? Or? Never carried a pistol, no. Mm -hmm. We fired pistols on the range, and carbines and M1s. And uh, I was lucky. I was an expert with both of them, so did well in there. And I got some papers in there to show the score I got of some of that. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get any uh, diseases out in the, in the jungles or anything? Or? Uh, I got one fever, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Dengue fever? Dengue fever. And uh, it wasn't too bad. I was, uh, no, I didn't have to go to the hospital or anything. I mm -hmm. stayed right in my tent and the medics took care of me. And that was the only thing that I got. Some of them got other fevers. Uh, one of my best friends got elephantitis. Have you ever familiar with elephantitis? Got a good picture of that in there too. Uh, that, uh, and as soon as he got the Alpha Tyson, they shipped him right home. And as soon as he got home, the state that went away. So. Now, what kind of uh, food and supplies were you always? Did you always have enough food? And uh, not supplies? always, but we had a lot of food we didn't <laughs> like. We got a lot of spam. I hated spam. <laughs> now I eat it again, but we, everything was canned. Uh, canned food and uh, dried food, and uh, uh, I <laughs> I carried a big tin can of peanut butter in my barracks in my bag, and uh, if I ever got hungry and didn't get enough food, I always had peanut butter to eat. So I survived with that. We got our beer rations every so often. We'd go, you know, sometimes be three months before you do it, and then they catch up with you, and you get a lot of extra beer, but it was not that strong, but we still had a good dive with it. Uh, now, <clears throat> on the Phil in the Philippines, um, what were your relationships like with the, the people who lived there? A very good relationship mm -hmm. with them. We had a lot of things. We uh, they had Filipinos that came to our camp, and the women did our laundry. They'd take our clothes and wash it and bring it back for us, which was something nice. Uh, in Tarlock, New Guinea, one of the places that, there was a distillery and a uh, sugar plantation. And 
I got real friendly with the people there, and they invited me to come. In fact, I spent a three-day weekend there one time with the family, and they had all kinds of good stuff to eat. And 100 proof alcohol, which would <laughs> kill you just about. <coughs> Excuse me. Hey, um, did you uh, get to see any USO shows or have any entertainment? Yes, yep. We, in fact, we built the stage for Bob Hope oh. at one place over there in New Guinea, and I got to see Bob. Francis Langford was with him, and we saw him twice uh, in two different years over there. And he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really did a good job. Mm -hmm. What what was your reaction when you heard of the death of President Roosevelt? Uh, <laughs> we were sorry. Because mm -hmm. uh, we saw an awful lot of President Roosevelt. And uh, we liked Harry Truman, too. Mm -hmm. uh, he was quite good. In fact, I got a nice letter from him in the back of the book there when I got discharged from signed by Harry Truman. What was your reaction when you heard about the uh, dropping the atomic bombs on Japan? We tickled to death. We were in the Philippines. We were in Clark Field in Manila. And we were preparing to go to Japan, to invasion Japan. We were going to go in northern Hokkaido. And the, one of the biggest problems was we'd been in the tropics for two years. If it got down to 70, we got cold. And we were going to go to northern Hokkaido where they had snow and ice. And they were training us to try and get used to that. In fact, mm -hmm. on the ship they said we would have to get out and do exercise without any shirts or anything on to build our body up to the cold weather. And then they dropped the bombs. And the second one they surrendered and we had enough points to go home. Mm -hmm. They sent us home. Our outfit still went on to Japan, Tokyo. But uh, a lot, most of us had enough points we could go right home, which was very good. Yeah, um, is there anything else you want to add to your story? Uh, <clears throat> one thing that might be interesting, in both outfits, the 880s and the 871st, have annual reunions. Okay. And we go all over the United States uh, to the reunion, <clears throat> which is very good. In fact, this year we go to Niagara Falls, Canada, to the 871st reunion. How long have you been going to the reunions? Uh, 1970. 1970 we started. They had them before I was involved. They started in 1950. Yeah, it started in 1950. And uh, 1970 they had the first one in Syracuse, which is closest. And our whole family went, and it was a family affair. They had a lot of things for the kids and... So forth. Uh, now, have you kept in contact with anyone that you served with personally? Yes, I have. I, I still contact quite a few, but one of the biggest problems, there was eight of us in the squad that were in the tent all together. Mm -hmm. There's only one other one left. The others have all died. Mm -hmm. And we did keep contact, close contact with them and visited them all over the United States uh, and uh, got to know them quite well. There's one left that he lives in Oregon, Salem, Oregon, and we've been out to see him and visit him and stay with him. And, uh, uh, very nice. The the reunions we go to, there's a couple guys from New York State. In fact, the, our main officer and the, the head of our reunion outfit is from uh, Tupper Lake in New York. And we get to see him, too. He was a captain. Now, did you uh, <clears throat> make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes, I did. Uh, I got some training with the... When, when I got out of the service, instead of going back with the Walden Telephone Company, where I had the job, I got a job with New York Telephone Company. And I got the training and got GI Bill, some payments while I went to that with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't do a lot of schooling or anything, but I just did that. Did you ever use, make use of the 5220 Club? Uh, <coughs> no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, one problem I had, I, I lost my hearing in the service. We were in uh, on the Philippines, and we were next to an ammunition depot, and the Jap plane came over and dropped a bomb and blew the whole depot up. And the guy I was with, we were working on a uh, 
shovel that picked up dirt, you know, a big uh -huh. shovel mm -hmm. with tracks on it and stuff. And both he and I got underneath the thing. We were protected by the thing, but it blew up all over. And I lost my hearing for a week, and then it came back, uh, and that was all right. I thought I was all right, but it wasn't good, and it gotten a lot worse since. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went, I was probably about four or five years after I got out of the service down to New York City to meet with the veteran people to see what they could do to help me with that. And I walked in, there was a table like this with three doctors sitting behind it. And they said, hello, and I said, hello, back, and that was my hearing test. I didn't get anything out of it. Really? So I was a little upset with that, but that, I got along all right. Mm -hmm. So I don't get any help with my hearing aids. I got to buy these. In fact, these are two new ones I just got. Have you been to the VA since then? Have uh, you reevaluated? No, I haven't. You probably you should, should look into should? it. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. definitely yeah. Do you uh, use the VA hospital at all? I, I signed up there, and they have a record of me, and I got a pass for there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should go see them. In fact, the the one guy that's still living in our outfit was a guy who was underneath the, <laughs> the shovel with us with a little off. So I got a witness. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think in our I don't know if our records would have anything about that or not. Well, I think they they'd be able to, to figure out figure it out the cause of it. Okay. Um, how do you think um, your time in the service affected your life? Uh, it was a grown-up time. You know, I was 19 when I went in, just a kid, mainly. And uh, I grew up, and I learned to get along with people. I learned to work. I, I enjoyed the military. I still enjoy you know, all the things you have to do in the military, which are quite strict and so forth. And I still live that way. I still kind of straight try to be anyway. And I do attend a lot of military functions and things they have, if there's any of them around. Okay. Why don't you show us some of the things you brought in? Okay. <coughs> Can you see this? Oh, yes. This is the 871st Airborne Engineering Battalion. And it shows the places we were at, and they list Westover Field, Massachusetts. Port Moresby, New Guinea, Tilly Silly, New Guinea, Nabzab, New Guinea, Gusab, New Guinea, Lay, New Guinea, Hollandia, New Guinea, Aui, which is an island, Bayak, which is an island, San Francisco, which is where we took off from and came back to, Clark Field in Manila, which is where we were stationed when we got down to Manila, Farida Blanca, which is a Philippine Islands were one of the first place to land. And Yokohama, Japan, was where the outfit landed uh, when they went on to uh, Japan. Now I see uh, your name down at the bottom there. Is, is that you in one of those photographs? No, I'm not in any of these photographs, but there are people I know that were in our outfit. Uh -huh. I got a lot of photographs of me in the book, but I, I'm not on this one. I wonder if they'd be interested, Bob, to know that a grandson did that uh, of the... Uh, oh, a grandson, grandson of one of the guys I've been in the service with. Yes. And, in he's fact, going, and he, yeah, go he's going to head up the reunion this year for us in Niagara Falls, Canada. Oh, that's nice. That's, that's one of the things our guys are getting older and things we have a... We're forgetting a lot of things and... Not able to do as good, but it's been a family affair, and a lot of them are, you know, the family are taking over and have, having reunions and things for it. Got to look and see. Okay, this is me. You know, when was that taken? This is uh, 1943? February of 43, the top one, and this is May of 43 on the bottom one. This is me in Camp Lee, Virginia, May and June of 43. And this is where I took the quartermaster training and truck driver license. I enjoyed that too. I learned to drive the big trucks. 
had a lot of fun driving around Virginia. Okay. This is the, the HMS Sommeldite, which is a converted duck freighter, which was, and the crew was all Dutch, and uh, a lot of them didn't speak English, they just spoke Dutch, which didn't make out, but uh, I, I was lucky, I got one of the good jobs on board ship. The, uh, as I said, the black people had all the KP and everything, the, the dishes and all that stuff, and uh, a lot of us did guard duty in the boat, but my squad I was in, the Dutch every day got a beer racing. They had a hole full of food, and we went down and got the beer and brought it up for the Dutch every day. And we were able to steal a bottle once in a while, which <laughs> was real good. <laughs> that was good duty. <clears throat> now we'll just do some of these now. Are these photographs you yourself? Yes. Uh, you took a camera over with you? Yes, I did. These are all me, and this is at Hollandia, New Guinea, and the little natives are with us there, little black boys. That they would come when we had our uh, dinner or mess, and uh, we'd empty our mess cans out in the garbage can, and they'd sit there and steal all the stuff and eat it, which was good for them. And I wanted to see if... No, Tojo isn't here. We had a uh, monkey we called Tojo. Was oh. a, He's, that, in He's in there in another picture. Yeah, another picture. Yep. It's interesting in Hollandia, the uh, the monkey hated the Filipinos. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's because they captured them or mistreated them or whatnot. And he guarded our tent, and we tied him to the center pole of the tent. <laughs> there he is, right there. If you can see it. Tell, okay. Bob, tell them who the girl is up above. Okay. We tied them to the center pole in the tent. And if any Filipinos, sometimes they come around and steal stuff out of the tent, he would keep them out of there. He'd go out and grab a hold of their legs and bite the daylights out of them and <laughs> keep them out. So he was our guard. This is Paquita Rose. She was the daughter of the, I told you about the distillery people in Tarlock. Uh, uh, Tarlock. <coughs> she was the daughter. And their mother and father trusted me very much with her, where they wouldn't trust a lot of the other troop. And I was harmless, too, so I got to know her very well. That's what he says, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had a lot of good experience. That, that from the original negative of the oh, flag really? in Iwo Jima, yeah. <clears throat> we had a photographer in our outfit in New York City. And he took all kinds of big pictures, and he uh, he swapped them with other people that had them, and made quite a collection. And I was lucky to get a bunch of his collections. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I don't know if we'll do all the. <laughs> uh, I don't think we'll show this picture, but th this is interesting. Oh, man, I missed it. What? Uh -huh. One more. Uh, that's the awesome. Yeah, this one here. Uh, at the land of New Guinea, a uh, plane went down up in the mountains, back up in the Owen Stanley Mountains. And uh, <coughs> we went back up there and we found this Indian tribe up there. And the, all of the leaders of the tribe wore, wore horns on their penises. And the men had a little cloth on their penis. It's quite interesting. They left their testicles hanging down and just had their hands there. But I think the men were bragging. Some of them had the horns up in the air instead of down. <laughs> but they were headhunters originally. But they didn't bother us a bit that way. Tell them what somebody said when they saw those pictures. They thought. Oh, <laughs> I knew you'd do a lot of things, but I never knew you could blow a horn. <laughs> Bob, did Len uh, do the airplane, the pictures on your, the airplane? Get my hat over there, can you, honey? Yes. Yes, uh, well, he done quite a few of them. Uh, yeah. Len Birnbaum, who's in 
Illinois and still alive. He was an artist. Uh -huh. And he painted a lot of the pictures on the airplane. And he headed up this reunion in Chicago that we went to, and he painted our symbol of the 880th Airborne Engineer. And he has a big picture of it, and that's the symbol that we had. It's, also a, did some of the it's a tractor with wings. Oh, nice. Now, are they, is that why you have these photographs in here? Did he do some of these? Uh, some of the ones on the planes, yes. Uh, well, maybe we could just... Now, these were some of the planes that were on one of the bases when you were there? We were usually at an airfield, and these planes were always on an airfield someplace. And uh, he did some of them, but a lot of them were other people. Uh, he did RC-47 and things that we had, but these are mostly all bombers. But he did do a couple of those, too. Did you fly in the same C-47 all the time, then? Uh, not the same one. They get different ones, but uh -huh. we flew in C-47s all the time. Uh -huh. Got another set of them here if you want to see them. Okay, sure. C-47s won the war, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he brought all the troops, and brought all the food, and all the ammunition. And but they're not what does the war this, these days. And you said that the top uh, photo was from uh, Dick Bong's? Yeah, the Major Bong's. Uh, he was a fighter pilot, and he was a leading war race. He shot down more jet planes than anybody else. I, he got more than what they had there, but. Okay, did you have any? Okay, well, thank you very much for. You're welcome.